And we are recording after more tef technical difficulties than Apollo 13. And Chelsea saved us both. It's episode 252 with Chelsea Bins. And returning for the fourth time, fifth time, Bruce Ackman, author of Behind the Murder Curtain, as well as The Art of the Investigation. And because I have the IQ of a chimp, I couldn't get the, the PowerPoint to be pulled up. But the beautiful and intelligent Chelsea Bins pulled it up. And so without, without further ado, I will have you guys introduce yourself and... Teach me, because apparently I don't know how to use technology. So, introduce. Well, Bruce, you've been on here. No one want, You don't need to introduce yourself again, Bruce. You you don't get to introduce yourself anymore. Chelsea, please introduce yourself. Well, hi. Thank you for having us on your program, Tommy. Of course. Um, and of course, as you said, my name is Chelsea Benz, and I'm a professor at the famous John Jay College of Criminal Justice in Manhattan. Um, I also received my PhD there, so I am a alma mater, proud one of the school, and also now a professor at my alma mater, which is just a great honor, um, and I love working there, and here I am. Absolutely. That's insane. Yeah. And how'd you, I, how, well, I don't want to sidetrack you, but I will because I have no attention span. How, how, how did you and Bruce end up, I know, you know, co-authors, but how did you guys cross paths? Well, I'm very involved in the investigative community. I'm also a licensed private investigator, and I have experience as an investigator having worked in the city and state of New York before I became a college professor. Um, and I'm very active in the community, and I met Bruce that way. Uh, Bruce was the longtime president of SPY, the Society of Professional Investigators, um, and so obviously an authority on the field, and, uh, and we connected uh, through, through that. Awesome. Yeah, Bruce is the Yeah, Chelsea person. came to me with this idea. This idea was completely hers. She said, you know, Bruce, there's a lot of books written about investigations, how to investigate. But there really isn't any book that talks about the soft skills, the skills that you need to be a great investigator. And she said, I think this is something that we should put in a book. And that's exactly how this thing came about. So Chelsea gets all the credit for having the idea of creating this book. Shout out, Chelsea. Well, thank you for saying that, Bruce. But I'd like to give credit to you as well. I mean, I came to you to validate this idea. I said, hey, you know, I, I have this idea. Do you, what do you think? Um, you're, you're a leader in the field, and I want to see what your thoughts are. And you really helped to validate it and help to get it out there. Um, get some of the recruit some of the best investigators in the field who became the authors of our book and you know we just had a great time doing it it was such a great collaborative effort so i think i asked bruce about this the first time he came on the podcast and bruce was on one of the early episodes so bruce could see me stumbling through this this process but i remember asking about the the ability to um you know it's it's kind of like I don't know, it's kind of like CIA surveillance or something, right? You you often don't, you don't want to use evidence from a method that itself is classified because then that tips the hand at your technological capabilities and superiority. And thus you don't, it's like us cracking the Enigma code, but like we didn't want to tip our hands to the Nazis because we were like, they are feeding us everything right now. We don't want to show up where they, hey, I'll be here at two and all of a sudden the allies are there at two, right? Because that now you've, you've run that source dry. So I asked you, uh, to segue that, I asked, I remember asking Bruce about learning how to do this investigation stuff and how, and is that itself, is that a weapon that the potential or existing criminals could use against you because they now see your playbook? And I asked you all about that, and clearly I am now getting the answer delivered to me in a, in a class A way with a PowerPoint. So does this answer that question? <laughs> I think so. I think so. You know, a lot of the qualities of a great investigator that we're going to be talking about that we featured in our book are qualities that some people do have innately, right? Perhaps not all of them, though, right? I doubt that anyone innately has every single quality that we describe in our book, uh, but some they might. Um, and others will have to perhaps be honed by that person, right? But it's really a matter of being aware and cognizant of what those are and how you can learn and grow and hone them. And I think that's what our book brings to the investigative community, really that awareness 
um, which is especially critical for your newer investigator, your budding investigator, your student of investigations and or criminal justice that aspires to work in the investigative realm um, that once they have this awareness of what these great qualities are, they can work on honing them if they don't already have them today. And I think this book gives um, people the, the tools that they need in order to do that okay. and, and have that awareness, which I think is critical. Yeah. Yeah. It's like the raw talent, right? It's like the six, six, eighth grader who maybe has never dribbled a basketball before, but it's like, Hey, you're already like figuratively and literally head, head and shoulders above everyone. If you can just learn how to get rebounds, like you're, you're going to go to the NBA. Is that that type of thing? Or am I, am I just, am I delay, well, am I delaying the PowerPoint? Am I, is, is all, are all of the answers no, to my I questions? Think, I think you're making great points. I mean, my own father who was a basketball star in high school told me how he practiced in the dark in the basement yeah. um, in order to learn how to play better. Oh, sure. And I think it's those kind of techniques, right. That you learn in this book about how anything is possible, right? You don't have to be born the greatest player. You don't have to be born the greatest investigator, um, but you can become one. Mm -hmm. You can become one. Um, and, you know, it, this is all towards really professionalizing the field of investigations and seeing it grow as a discipline and as a body that has, um, you know, rigor, uh, mm -hmm. that, that there is an art to it. Yeah. Um, and yeah. so that's, that's really the spirit of it. Well, that wasn't the smoothest segue ever. There's an art to it. That being said, but dum dum, the art of investigation. All right, how do we dive into this thing? So, as we know, investigators are highly skilled people because of the CSI effect, right? Everybody knows about investigation yes. today. Um, and that's the really exciting thing, right? We have a really captive audience. Um, but you know, what you don't hear a lot about are the qualities we're going to talk about today, right? Those soft skills. You hear more about. Um, the crime scene, the evidence um, collection, that sort of thing from all the popular shows. Um, but this is sort of that missing piece, those, those mental traits. All right. um, and so that's what we're going to talk about today, um, those mental traits and, and how you can hone them. And this is a visual for everyone. And, and, uh, so and, they have that and you, takeaway. And you guys are going to put, you are going to put it on Audible, correct? Right? Maybe? Maybe that am I? Oh, sorry, I think I'm interrupting. It's. <laughs> I know Bruce is a big uh, proponent of that, so I have a feeling it'll show up there. I, I've I've been pushing that on Bruce since the day I met him. Okay. And so these are the qualities uh, that we feature in our book. They're, of course, not exhaustive, but they're the ones that we've curated and believe to be among the best, um, based on our experience as investigators. Those that we have. Uh, spoken to and what the literature does today um so that's it tenacity patience skepticism etc okay well also for for everyone for for you know obviously you don't need to read every slide um if if you <clears> don't <throat> want to but for everyone listening because a lot of people listen instead of just watching so for can you go back one the so for everyone listen, yeah so it's it's there are I mean so the qualities of a great investigator so there's yeah so there's a cer there's certain different like edges to it right and I think Bruce explained that and I think Michael Vecchione explained that that's not always just yeah it's not you can't get it all out of you know um, actually I think it was Bruce that said this you can't yeah you said this in in, in behind the murder curtain you you can't just you know you don't go to you don't go and you go to the course and you go, this is how you profile, this is how you do this. And then you walk out into the field and you go, there's a mafia guy. Let's look at A, B, and C and tie the ropes together. You said there's like a lot of structural framework, but then there's also a lot of just kind of like impromptu, like kind of lean into it and do it on the fly. That was more of a comment than a question, but <laughs> sorry, go on. <laughs> no, I think there's a lot of, and Bruce will attest to this too, I think there's a lot of, learning as you go. Um, I actually talked about this recently on another podcast, but how, you know, when I first started my career as an investigator, I was only a week in, less than a week in, and I was told, okay, you're going out on an undercover mission. And that was not, I did expect to do that type of work, but I didn't expect to do it in the first week of my job. And I had read about it. Uh, I, I knew what to do, but I'd never actually done it myself yeah. and I think there is a little bit of um, a delta there that only sp experience can provide um, with actually knowing what it is like to be in that situation and what you will do when you encounter it 
Um, but I think the best thing you can do in preparation is to read as much as possible yeah. about being in those situations and how, how to handle them once, once they're, once they're once you're in them. Yeah. Have all and the, Bruce yeah. can attest to this too. I'm sure. Yeah. Have all the ammunition you can have. I was, if, again, I get sidetracked easily, but being pre-med, I remember going into the MCAT and I was like, there's no way I can know what they're going to ask, but what if I just memorize everything? And I remember I memorized something like 300 slides of like equations and facts. And, but it's, it's kind of, you know, I would loosely relate it to it is you can't know exactly what you're going to do, but you might as well have the entire roadmap in your head and then you can jump into it. I'm going to stop interrupting. I'm, be, I'm being very bad at that right now. <laughs> No, absolutely. But that's where, you know, it's a perfect segue to talking about these qualities because that's adaptability right there. Um, how, you know, you can study all day how to, you know, what you do in an undercover operation, but then are, do you have the ability to be adaptable to the situation once you're in it? And that's what it really takes. And so again, being cognizant of that mm -hmm. and knowing what it means to be adaptable and how to handle those situations in a practical way, mm -hmm. um, I think is essential. Absolutely. Yeah, the book doesn't just list these qualities. Yeah. It gives actual real life examples of how each one of these qualities work in a particular situation that usually resulted in a successful investigation. Mm -hmm. so it was just not enough to say tenacity. Yeah. Show me an example, show us examples. And that's what we searched for. And that's what we wrote about in the book, not just listing these very important qualities, but actual real life examples of these qualities. Yeah. All right. Touche, Bruce. <laughs> Yes, yeah, so we invited uh, 15 investigators to speak about their experiences, and each one was essentially assigned a quality, if you will. Mm -hmm. And uh, they gave either a case study or a set of case studies. Uh, and first they talked about their experience um, in the field. They talked about how they, what they feel in terms of the importance of the quality that they were talking about. Um, and different tips and tricks about ways that you can hone that quality yourself as an investigator. And then again, as Bruce said, talk about an actual case or set of uh, cases or incidents where they uh, put that quality to use um, in favor of a great investigation. Or as Bruce said, there's a tale or two of what not to do. <laughs> and I think those are really helpful, really, really helpful as well. Yeah. Th those who suffer remember, right? Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. Um, so we can get to some of that too, sure. uh, if you like. Sure. Wait, just go back. Uh, uh, of course. So, uh, yeah, to the forward. So uh, Bob Boyce, Bob Boyce was the chief of detectives of the New York City Police Department. That means, Tommy, that he supervised 6,000 investigators. Okay. 6,000 investigators. So if anybody, anybody is an expert witness yeah. to what the 15 qualities of a great investigator are, it's certainly Chief Boyce, yeah. Chief of Detectives of the City of New York, which has a reputation, yeah. I think, yeah. of having some of the best detectives in the world. Yeah. They've just solved some of the most incredible cases in the world. So we asked him to do the following. And he, in this forward, very skillfully reflects how important it is to have these attributes. That without these attributes, you could do your job, but you're not going to do your job that well. Yeah. And the, the forward alone from Bob Boyce is so very important to read. All right. And he talks about the time sometimes it takes to resolve an investigation. He talks about the Eaton Potts case in New York, which was a child that was murdered walking to school. It was solved 30 years later, 30 years later, okay? So reading the forward and having Bob Boy start off the book, I thought was just such a powerful introduction for us. Yeah, good Lord. And yeah. it really is, it's, yeah. it's amazing. Yeah.
Okay, I'm going to take this one, tenacity. You know, uh, Tommy, could you imagine being convicted for a crime you did not commit? Yeah. Could you imagine having witnesses saying that you were in another part of the country at the time and you still got convicted of a murder and you're sentenced to 25 years to life and you've tried the appeals and nothing has worked, but you're actually innocent. That sounds like an anxiety nightmare. Well, these, these two private investigators, and you talk about tenacity. I mean, this case actually defines that. These two private investigators, Bob Ron, retired NYPD, and Kim Anklin came to, ca to the investigative world from, from California. They get contacted by um, this prisoner, the, the guy who was actually convicted by the prisoner's mom and says, I've hired already a number of private detectives. I tried everything I can. My son is in prison for 25 years to life for a crime he did not commit because he was in Florida with me at the time and other witnesses, but he actually got committed he got convicted by the testimony of one woman who later went in and recanted that testimony and the court still refused to overturn. They said to the investigators, you have to develop new information, new evidence. We don't believe this recantation from this witness. We think she was telling the truth the first time and when she recanted we think she's lying so this guy's going to stay in jail now when this murder had uh, been committed in brooklyn this this gentleman was in uh orlando with his family he had all kinds of receipts from hotels plane trips videos everything and he was still convicted believe it or not this was some case so in order to get involved in a case like this, and this is actually a cold case because the murder had occurred years ago, could you try to imagine how much work is involved in trying to overturn something like this? There is an incredible amount of work. They literally had to start from the beginning. They had to read, spend weeks reading all the court testimony, reviewing all the evidence, looking at everything that, that had existed during the first investigation. And then they went back and they recreated the crime scene. And they noticed, for instance, that there's no way the witness could have seen what she claimed she had seen at that hour of the night. Yeah. She was too far away. You know, it would be like being in the bleachers of Yankee Stadium and be able to identify somebody sitting all the way on the other side in the third row. I yeah. mean, it would be impossible. Yeah. You know, it couldn't be done. Yeah. It couldn't be done. And this took a very, very long time. Finally, they, they kept working and they found additional witnesses who came forward and identified somebody else. This is years after the fact. Years later, when this guy is still sitting in prison, finally, they were able to convince the Brooklyn District Attorney's Office to consider, just to consider, maybe somebody else was doing it. Sure. And the Brooklyn District Attorney's Office at that time had actually created a new unit to go out and look at these cases to see maybe sometimes there were false convictions. Yeah. Remember, this guy got convicted on the testimony of one woman who was a drug abuser who had made a deal with the government that if she testifies against this guy, then she won't go to jail. And if she doesn't testify against him, she's going to go to jail. Well, that's a little, uh, that's a little uh, conflicting interests. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. So, Excuse me. You're good, Bruce. So, how does that how does that work then? If she can come in and say this is my this is my testimony, and then later say I recant that, is 
I don't obviously I don't know anything about law. It's well, it's up to the judge to whether okay. he believes her or not. Okay. Because he could believe this recantation is a lie. It's under duress or something. That that's what he said. He said, "I, I don't believe you. I believe you the first time. I don't believe you the second time." So Kim and Bob, the investigators, had to spend months and months re-interviewing everybody, going to the crime scene, finding out who actually did commit the murder, which they did, going down and interviewing this guy, and he finally confessed. And if it wasn't for their tenacity, because everybody kept saying it's not going to work, Four private detectives before them said, "There's we, we tried. We can't find anybody. Mm-hmm. The court said, we didn't believe the witness when the witness recanted. But through their tenacity, incredible tenacity of re-interviewing everybody, finding new witnesses, going to the crime scene, spending months and months redoing the investigation, they, they freed this guy. And he finally walked out of court. He walked out of prison a free man because of what Kim Anklin and Bob Ron did. Even though everybody told them, it's never going to happen. You're never going to do it. We've tried. We've tried. But you know what? They did it. And they did it because they were so tenacious. They didn't let one lead go without following it through. And could you imagine when everybody tells you, we tried already, we tried, we tried, we had teams of people, we tried everything. And to be successful after that was incredible. And they received all sorts of awards and, and, and you know, uh, I mean, they're, they're just an, an incredible team. But this case to me actually defines the term tenacity. No. Because they were so tenacious. And could you imagine freeing somebody? I've never done that. Boy, I tell you, that must feel great. Must be that. Imagine actually freeing somebody who was sentenced to 25 years in jail for a murder they did not. I mean, with all the cases that I've done, I've never had that the opportunity to do that. And I, 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 I think it's an incredible story. Now, do you, and again, this may, maybe this is like a, a 101 question and you guys are both going to be like, what? No. Is there, is there like an actual... <clears throat> You know, you know, like medicine, right? There's like DO, MD, and DO, and like you know, they're entirely different, or not entirely different, but it's the entire idea of medicine, right? Like America works on like, uh, like treatment, right? You go in with a bad heart, whatever, versus the idea of like preventive, right? Is you know, how about instead of waiting until you have a heart attack, how about we teach you about the importance of eating broccoli and going for a walk every day? Now, is there something like that in law? Is there? you know, you're Bruce and you're taking down medical serial killers or whoever or mob bosses. Is there, and this is my stupid question, is there a flip side? Are there people who it's like, do they train simply to be the proverbial devil's advocate? They try to, they try to get someone that they think is, I mean, obviously that's what, that's what your lawyer does. But I mean, like for cases like this, are there like special investigators who are like, they, they specialize in uh, overturning things of a wrongly convicted person. That might yeah, be the dumbest no, question there, ever. There are, there are wrongful conviction groups um, in both uh, the government and, and in, the, in the private sector. Uh, it's like, to me, doing God's work. Yeah. But uh, it's very, very difficult. Yeah. yeah. And they take a very long time. And of course, they're not always successful. I mean, yeah. DNA has helped, of course, yeah. because DNA has freed a, a number of people you know, that, that were convicted, but, um, yeah, there, there are wrongful conviction units now in a number of DA's offices and they go back and they, they take a look because, um, particularly in Brooklyn, there were a number of cases where one detective used the same witness for every case and was caught being un- untruthful in a number of these cases. There are cases where the prosecution, this is one of them, didn't turn over all the evidence to the defense that they were supposed to. That's a real no-no. That's a real no-no. I can tell you, in every case that I've been in the federal government, and there were hundreds of them, the prosecutors were always following the straight and narrow. They always turned over all of the evidence, whether it would help our case or not, to the defense. 
but sometimes sometimes it gets uh, some prosecutors who really want to win yeah haven't done that yeah and that's not right it's not ethical and it's not legal but it has happened in this case there there was a statement from someone who recanted a testimony they gave and that statement was not provided to the defense until years later yeah terrible terrible imagine if you're the defendant yeah imagine if you're the defendant and there's some information out there that could free you but the def- but the prosecution doesn't share that with the defense. Yeah. How would you feel? Well, it's it's not to it ruin your life. Right? It is, and 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 Doctor Benz, I know, uh, I know, Bruce and I are going way off way off in the weeds. And as I always say, if we don't get through what you guys want to get through again, you're more than welcome on a second, third, fourth time. But we, I, I know, we're going way off the trails, like two sides into this. But I was going to say is, on that note, and today being what the nineteenth. November 19th, Monday being the 23rd anniversary of JFK's assassination, not to plug someone else's book, but a guy I'm having on, Jefferson Morley, his book, Ghost, about James Jesus Angleton, the head of CIA counterintelligence. He had a file on Oswald starting in 59 through 63, and not only did he have that file, he never brought it up. They didn't find out about it until not only after he retired, till after he died. The head of CIA counterintelligence had a file on the guy They killed the effing president. So that's what I'm thinking of like, yeah, withholding evidence, it can go a little higher up. It can have some geopolitical implications that ripple throughout the decades. But the law is very clear. Yeah. Everything that the prosecution has, they're supposed to share with defense. And conversely, everything the defense has, they're supposed to share with the prosecution. And that's how we define what a fair trial is in America. Yeah. Yeah. If you don't, it's going to make it very, very hard for one side. Yeah to actually uncover all the facts. Yeah. And only through the, again, the tenacity of, of these two investigators, is this gentleman free today? Yeah, yeah. Sorry for getting off to a sidetrack. No, not at all. Uh, I mean, it's an important topic. Um, and again, you know, there is definitely specialty areas when it comes to investigations and investigators. And sometimes, though, they might develop a specialty just by a case. Um, I believe this was Kim and Bob's first case of this nature. Um, and now I would consider them experts, but I don't believe that they were necessarily going into this. Okay. Um, but this case definitely provided that experience. So I think it can work uh, many different ways in terms of how investigators might develop that expertise. Sure, sure. Um, well, let's talk about self-control. This is another quality of a great investigator, um, and Gil Alba illustrates this beautifully in his work. Um, he does incredible, uh, he has his own investigative business um, and does former uh, NYPD, and he does an incredible job um, telling a story about the types of cases that he works on, uh, which are missing person case, uh, cases and how it takes and he demonstrates this in his case study um, of a missing female in New York, uh, a case uh, that was incidentally uh, not remains unsolved uh, to this day, which demonstrates that not all cases do have an outcome, uh, which goes back to the tenacity piece too a little bit. Um, you know, I think again from the shows, people think perhaps that a case can be solved in a half hour or uh, within a very short time frame. And sometimes maybe that is the case, you get very lucky. Uh, But a lot of times uh, things take a long time um, as the prior case demonstrated. And a lot of times things take a long time and you may not get the result that you intend, right? You still may have what is known as an unsolved case. Um, And that was the case with uh, the the story that Gil told. Um, However, it demonstrates again, a lot of self-control Um, when you work on these cases for many, many years and you don't see the outcome that you're looking for. And also he talks about the self-control that you need when you're working with adverse parties uh, in your investigation. Um, Not everyone is always happy with you as an investigator. Um, And I think that that's an important tale to learn. Sometimes people blame you because the case is not solved. Um, In Gil's case, he sometimes... Um, hears a lot of negative comments about law enforcement, 
uh, which is hard for him because he's former law enforcement. Um, so he understands both sides of a case where you are a victim's family and you really want justice. And that sometimes, you know, as a member of law enforcement, that cases go unsolved, whether you like it or not. Um, and no matter what you've done, you haven't left any stone unturned. And so um, he, his, his tale is a really important one, I think, and, and a good one for investigators to learn. Yeah. That you really do need uh, self-control to be a great investigator. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I've always imagined that it's got to be like, you know, it, it takes a certain amount. You know, it's what they say about surgeons. They're like, you need to be like a, you need to be like an auto mechanic. And it's not that it's not that you have to be a psychopath or a sociopath so much as you can't be swept up in oh my god here's a little girl and she was hit by a car and her intestines are hanging out you have to be zone in thousands of hours of like of experience like this is what we need to do we need to stop this we need to do this we need a triage we need this person here this person there because if you don't and you and I believe that's why you're not allowed to like operate on family members is like you can't be swept up in that. I imagine you have to be the same as like an investigator or a prosecutor, right? You can't, oh my god, you killed so and so, and I grew up with that person, and that was my best friend's daughter. And no, you have to just, you know, it, on the facade, I imagine it can look cold and calculating, but in reality, that's how you uphold justice, right? Well, I think you do, and Bruce can attest to this too. There are some very difficult situations that you are investigating yeah. um, at times. And certainly the case that Gil talked about was one of them, yeah. right? Um, a missing pregnant woman. Um, you know, this is something that's obviously really concerning and something you want to get answers for. Um, and, you know, just sometimes you don't have those answers despite exhaustive, exhaustive efforts. And I think that's one of the big challenges that you have to learn to overcome as an investigator that sometimes no matter what you do there's still those question marks and you and you still hope that someday you know that we will have an outcome yeah. um, but you have to accept that maybe there won't be one and i think that can be difficult absolutely. for a lot of people especially for a new investigator absolutely yeah absolutely if, if you ever met gil albert he has incredible self-control i've never seen gil lose it ever yeah um and I can understand how dealing with the families of these victims, yeah. uh, Gil would just be in incredible because he comes across as somebody who legitimately cares about the families, cares about the victim. He's the kind of person that you want to sit to and and and, and talk and, and open up to and yeah. open up your heart to. And yeah. he just has this incredible skill. And dealing with the families must have been so difficult. I mean, I've dealt with families, who are the victims, of, uh, families of people who were murdered in hospitals. And uh, some of the families are very calm and some of the families are not very calm. Yeah. And sometimes they'll take it out on the investigator and it takes a tremendous amount of self-control. Hey, listen, we've all seen the videos of some of our fellow citizens who are unhappy about certain things getting into the face of police officers yeah. right there out on the street and yelling and screaming yeah. at them well they just stand there and take it yeah and it's it's an incredible amount of, of, of self-control that they have and Gil uh, is is just incredible because doing missing person cases is just not about the missing person it's about the families who are constantly calling you yeah and asking you questions and the families in, in my experience, go go through like a, a couple of different phases. Sure. The first phase is, is is that they're completely shocked at what happened. The second phase is that they're angry. Yeah. They're angry at the world for allowing this to happen. They're angry at the investigator. And then the third phase is when they usually sort of break down and, and cry. And it takes a really skilled investigator to get the family, to get the witnesses back on track to help. And Gil is just incredible when it, when it comes to that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I mean, Bruce, as I've told you, it's in, in 2014, I lost my oldest sibling to suicide. And obviously the, you know, the police had to investigate to make sure there's no foul play and there wasn't. But I mean, it took me years of, yeah, shocked 
followed by anger, taking out anger on everyone, followed by grief, followed just, you know, a whole, you know, just years of like, really, I would argue like not even like sober in the sense that I wasn't in a sober mindset, the anger, the sadness, the blame like that. I wasn't, you know, I wasn't at a baseline um, level of self-control and the ability to execute logic. But I, I often think about like, what would I have done if like, you know, obviously there's a whole, there's a whole case of, you know, thoughts and strings that come attached when the death of someone you love is also a self-inflicted death. But I've tried to like, what if I could just remove that aspect and like the grief of just losing someone, right? You know, grandma died two years ago. She was 86. She was just, she was old, right? That wasn't a murder. That wasn't a suicide. But I often think about something like that or losing my brother. Like, what if on top of the fact that you're already grieving loss, right? We've all lost someone. What if that person was taken from you? And then I think of, man, I would be a basket case to deal with. If an investigator was like, we need you to tell me about your brother. I would, you know, I would just be like, screw you. Find out who did it. I'm going to kill him myself. And they'd be like, we're going to come back tomorrow and talk to you, right? Luckily, that didn't have to happen. But yeah, I mean, I can only imagine just from my experiences of like, I wouldn't well, want to I'll, deal with it. I'll me. tell you, Tommy, one of the greatest examples of this was right after 9-11. Yeah. Right after 9-11, uh, my wife and I uh, volunteered at this National Guard Armory where families would come in looking for their loved ones, trying to find out Jeez. what happened to dad, what happened to my son, what happened to my daughter. And I saw these people go through these three phases that I just talked about. Yeah. They would first come in and they would be in shock. Where's my dad? Is he in the hospital? Did he get killed? What happened? They would be totally shocked. The next phase would be anger. They were mad at everybody. Yeah. They were mad at the world, yeah. which I can understand. We can understand. And the yeah. third phase is they would sit there and then all of a sudden they, they would start to cry. And I'll tell you something that, that I saw that I thought was unbelievable is that around the room in the armory, were members of the clergy, priests and, and, and rabbis and imen, and they would go over to the families and they were so wonderful. I never realized, really, I, I never realized how important the clergy could be at a time like this, Absolutely. but they would go over the families and really make the families so better. Even though sometimes the families were yelling and screaming, these these members of the clergy had such great self-control. Yeah. And I said, my God, here, here's a lesson for all yeah. of us how important self-control is in a time like yeah. this. Yeah, you don't you don't realize their power until you have nowhere else to turn. Again, like, yeah, I mean, having kind of moved out of, like, faith and belief and uh, just the entire field of religion. I remember after my brother died, the priest from our high school had, had come up to say the funeral service. And I remember talking to him and realizing that, like, I felt more comfortable in his presence than anyone because there's a certain, like, saintliness around them, right? It's like there's nothing you can do that upsets them. It's like the Buddhist quote about becoming detached is, like, when you meet someone who is truly on, like, a different plane of existence, when you unload your baggage onto them, whether it's directed at them or just in, whether you're angry at them or whether you're telling them about something, my girlfriend cheated on me, blah, blah, blah. It's like throwing a rock down a well, but you never hear the splash because they just don't react. They just let you keep throwing your stuff down the well. And you realize after a while, you're not even sure what it is. You're like, well, something's, something's off about this well. I'm throwing all this stuff in there and there's no splash and they're just looking at you and you realize you're like, oh man, like, thank you so much. Like, I just needed to dump, you know, simpler terms. I needed to like just offload all my shit. Right. And it's, yeah, I would I would say yeah, it's it's an odd thing when you realize just how powerful those people are and their ability to do that. End tangent. Sorry. No, I you're both of you are absolutely right. I mean, I think it's because of those stages of grief and how important it is to cycle through all of them that investigators try so hard to get closure. Yeah. For that family yeah, absolutely right because if you if you have a, an outcome if you have a body as sad as that is at least you have closure and you know what happened you can essentially solve the mystery perhaps and move forward and if you never know what happened to that person it can be very difficult for people to move forward because you're always going to have that thought 
well, what if? Yeah. Perhaps they'll knock on my door someday. Perhaps, you know, in the case of a missing person, perhaps um, they made themselves go missing. They just, you know, were tired of this life and wanted to start fresh. Or maybe they don't know who they are somewhere. And, um, you know, one day someone will recognize them and it'll all come to light, which I've seen these cases before. Um, so these are all possibilities that go through your head unless you have reason to believe otherwise. And so I feel like that cycle of grief is never going to be complete unless you do have that answer. Yeah, it's it's and I know it's another it's another side rant, if, uh, but um, Mike Durant, the the pilot that was shot down in Mogadishu in 1993, 1992, 1993, episode 95, he's the movie that Black Hawk Down is about. He was defended by uh, Gary Gordon and Randy Shugart, two Delta Force snipe, two Delta Force snipers that came in and defended his position until he was eventually taken captive. But he, uh, Mr. Durant, writes about in his book in the Company of Heroes. He said he was always, he, you know, why did I live? Survivor's guilt, all that stuff. But he's like, when I came back to the states, and I forget who it was, either Gary Gordon's wife or Randy Shugart's wife, came up to him and said, um, like there's a reason you survived and it was to give me peace of mind because you know it's a Mogadishu was a whole it, the whole city was chaos like you know they took the soldier they took the bodies of the US servicemen they mutilated them but no one knew what happened but then Mike Durant who survived and was literally there told her she's like you know like yes he was you know he he was shot in the head and he was killed instantly and this is what he did in his final moments and instead of being upset she was like thank you so much because I would have never known and I would go for the rest of my life. How did he die? Why is he in pain? What did, did X, Y, and Z happen? And Mr. Durant was able to say, this is what happened to him. And then to like Miss Gordon, this is what happened to him. And like, you know, he was shot here, here, and here. He, you know, suffered for a minute and then bled out. The other guy shot in the head, killed instantly. And it sounds brutal, but he said that both wives were, they said, that's why you survived was to give me that closure. And he said that changed his, his outlook on the rest of life. It was like, okay, I was able to provide that, right? It's even if the even if the truth is horrible, like I know exactly what happened to my brother when he took his life. Even if the truth is horrible, a horrible truth is so much better than even a slightly optimistic unknown, right? It's it's that closure. But again, I keep going off on side rants. So back to you, Dr. Vince. Well, on that note, let's talk about curiosity, sure. uh, which, again, is another amazing quality of a great investigator. And Emmanuel Welsh, our author of this chapter, uh, talks about this expertly in her experience doing uh, various investigations in New York City. Um, she, Speaking of undercover, she talks about some operations that she's done doing landlord-tenant investigations. Um, she does a number of other um, technology related uh, social media type investigations as well um, and talks to, and is also um, a French speaking PI and takes a lot of uh, unique cases across the globe and tells her tale of how being curious uh, helped her to have amazing investigative outcomes. And, and she really gives uh, you know, a great message to investigators when she asks questions uh, such as, you know, are you really a curious person or are you just asking questions? Yeah. And I think this is a great one to consider because I think a lot of people um, who are investigators might think that they are a great investigator because they are asking a lot of questions, but maybe they're really not listening to those answers. Um, not everyone is a great listener, listener naturally. And not only Emmanuel, she talks about this, but many other authors in the text talk about the art of active listening yeah. and how that contributes to these great outcomes that they have achieved as well. Um, and so her tale is one that demonstrates that um, where when you're speaking to a subject um, and you're interviewing a subject, uh, whether they know it or not, because in one of her stories, they didn't realize they were a subject, they just thought they were uh, renting her a room. Yeah. Um, and so, but she tells how she made the time and really invested in that relationship in a way where she kept probing 
uh, she wasn't satisfied with the answer and kept going and kept going. And that natural sense of curiosity that she developed over her life, which is a great story as well, um, about how she did that, right? Around the dinner table in the evening, uh, they had a habit of talking about a lot of different topics and asking a lot of questions of each other and of her, you know, her family, among her family, and how that really helped her to hone this sense of curiosity and how it enables her now in her professional life to really learn everything she needs to know about a situation and how that's really helped her to have these great investigative outcomes. Yeah. Yeah. I was going to, I was going to say, I feel like, yeah, if it wasn't like you're maybe, maybe the, the, maybe the, like the weeding out factor is, is like whether, and yeah, like you said, whether or not you are truly curious, cause like someone like myself where it's like, you know, I like podcasting now. I like cold war history before that I liked biology if I was tasked with doing an investigation, I imagine I would, I would try, I would give it my A, I put my best foot forward, but I would probably just be reading off questions. And then I would finish the questions and I'd be like, investigation finished. I went one through 10. But the reality is, is like, you can't, right? That's why I don't prepare any questions for this podcast, because it's to me, I'm like, that's not has to how it is. You just got to come on and be like, and we're recording and you just jump on into it, right? And you see where it goes, because that's where the, the real curiosity is what gets you to the, the core of it, right? Because otherwise, it's just like a, a sickening eye rolling, like tonight show type thing. Like, well, today I have on special agent Bruce Sackman and Dr. Chelsea Benz who investigate murderers back after these messages, right? It makes you want to jump in a vat of acid. You're like, why the hell am I listening to this? So it's that natural cue, right? I don't have to have you guys on. I want to have you guys on. And thus, it's a good podcast, or at least my egotistical self thinks it is. It's a good podcast because it's curious. It's off the cuff. It's real as opposed to question one, question two, question three. And it's innocent to say that about a podcast, but what if you're trying to find out who a murderer was, right? It Then there's some real world implications. I don't know why I keep apologizing for interrupting and then doing it two minutes later. So you know what? <laughs> well, it's so true. And this is why, you know, these, these stories are great. I think they're great for any investigator for at any level, but they're especially important for people starting out because, you know, again, this is a skill that you can hone. And I know myself, even I would consider myself an extremely curious person, sure. uh, which is why I got into the field Absolutely. of investigations to begin with. Uh, maybe too curious. My mother tells stories of me um, finding my uh, gifts from Santa and how I found the receipts from Sears. And that's how I knew they were not from Santa at all. Sorry if that spoils it for any of the listeners here. Um, but and this was at a very young age because I was where I was reading it th three years old. Um, and so I think that helped to make me a very curious person that I learned to read at a young age. Um, and so I was always able to take in information. But again, um, these are qualities that you can hone later in life. And having you know this top of mind really makes you to think uh, about when you're talking to someone, You know, are you really listening to what they're saying and then taking it in and, and asking the right follow-up questions based on what you've heard. And that's part of the active listening technique that a lot of the authors in the book talk about, um, you know, for this very reason. And I think a lot of us starting out, uh, you know, that's why I say this is great for new investigators because, you know, I remember myself making, even though I consider myself a very curious person, making a list of questions for some of the first interviews that I did when I was an investigator for the city. And I remember people telling me, you don't need that list. Yeah. I said, well, it just makes me feel better. Yeah. You know, what if I forget something yeah. or, you know, so if you do need that crutch in the beginning, That's it's fine. completely fine. Yeah. But if you, um, again, hone the skill of curiosity, you will find that you don't need that because as you're talking to the person, just like how you're talking to us, Tommy, it becomes fluid mm -hmm. um, and it just becomes a mutual conversation. Yeah in time yeah. um but some people need to develop that but you yeah. can yeah you know, and you're absolutely right and I, I don't know i don't mean to like crap all over questions because with with that's i mean when i'm when i'm email when i'm cold calling emailing authors that's one thing i say is i like to just do it live but i always say i will provide questions as like a scaffolding if that makes you the guest feel more comfortable like i don't need them but i com completely would understand it's like I've never done a podcast before and this guy's just going to have me on about his book. Sure. You have some bullet point questions and it's, you know, a lot of them say, let's stick to the questions. And I'm just, just kind of smile. I'm like, okay, we'll stick to the questions. But I mean, you get them one and two in and then you can, you just kind of 
push them off the beaten path. And it turns out, I think most people enjoy that. But yeah, it's definitely yeah. It's they're not they're not all for naught. They can they can act as is right. It's like the alcoholic having the beer in the fridge or the recovering alcoholic. They might never drink again, but they know that that tall boy is in there, and they're like, if the withdrawals get too bad, I can. And that that tall boy might sit in there for ten years, and they'll never touch it. Having questions is kind of like that. If all else goes to shit, I got my scaffolding, right? But you don't really need it. Well, I think the nervousness comes to, and Bruce sure. can speak to this too, about how, you know, sometimes you only get one chance yeah. with yeah. a witness. Yeah. And that's it. That's your time. Yeah. You may never get yeah. to speak to them again. And I found this out working on hotlines uh, yeah. for the city. You know, someone will call in. Uh, with a concern and statistically they'll never call back. Yeah. Right. You, they'll never follow up with you and you may never speak to them again. So it is critical that you get all of the information that you need in one shot. Sure. And you also don't want to scare the person away and sound too investigator like, yeah. or, you know, you don't want to fire too many questions either. So they're coming back to the title. There really is an art to yeah, it. Absolutely. Uh, you really have to make someone feel comfortable and get as much information as you can without also scaring them away with, by firing questions. Um, but you know, it's a delicate balance and over time you do tend to get better at it. Absolutely. Yeah. And again, yeah, apples and oranges. I'm, I'm using my experiences with podcasting where there's, I mean, there's no actual like real world implications to what happens versus, yeah, investigating crime. <laughs> you know, there's one's a little more serious than the other. So I can see where it's like you have one shot. And whereas I have one shot, I'm like, yeah, if it goes bad, it goes bad. It's not going to get a lot of views. If you guys mess up the shot, it's like we might have just let the murderer get away. So, yeah, a little, little different. <laughs> Yeah, when I interview there's someone, a lot of implications. I, yeah, I, I always like to have at least a list of the topics. Sure. Not the actual question written out. Sure. But I usually interview somebody and there's somebody else in the room with me mm -hmm. that's that's taking notes because I'm very fearful that I'm gonna miss something. Yeah. And then when the interview is over, I always have this little fear in the back of my mind. Did I forget something? Because I'm really a lot of witnesses I'm not going to be able to go back to, especially the subject of the investigation I'm not going to be able to go back to. Yeah. So mm -hmm. even after doing this for 40 plus years, yeah, I'll always have notes as to exactly what I want to cover because I will forget. But um, as Chelsea says, once you start talking and get going, you have to establish a rapport with someone. Yeah. You just have a list of questions and they get. You know, question, short answer, question, short answer. Well, you've covered everything, but you really haven't covered everything. Yeah, right. It's like speed dating. It's like you guys might mm -hmm. have knocked it out and like statistically you might have had a good date, but like, you know, was it actually enjoyable? Where are you from? What do your parents do? What do you, you know, it's eh, right. And again, I'm realizing how much of a hypocrite I am for saying like, I don't do questions or notes. And I have a whole notebook of notes that I've taken during the podcast going, I mean, just random March, and I don't know any of the notes mean, March 1st, Led Zeppelin, hydrogen bomb. I don't know what that means, but that's what I was thinking at the time. And it's, yeah, so I'm being a total hypocrite. You don't need notes. Meanwhile, I've got <laughs> like 90 pages right here. But yeah. So, yeah. Well, you know, what you do to, to get around that really, in, instead of having a list of questions, right, you go into the situation knowing as much as possible sure. about that person. And in the case of, um, like I described, taking calls on a hotline, you don't have the advantage of knowing that information in advance. But in many cases, when you're interviewing a subject, you do. Um, and so if you go into that situation knowing as much as humanly possible about that person and the situation, then the questions will naturally come to you in the conversation. Um, of course, without revealing what you know, but you will know um, what they don't know that you know, and you can keep probing to get the information that you need. Dr. Burns, I feel like you would be good in the CIA. I feel like I feel like you would absolutely, you could be a spook. Like, do they know what you know they know? I would confess everything, even if I didn't do anything. I would just be like, I did it. I bombed the building. I'm sorry. But yeah, no, but you're right. It's, yeah, it's. I mean that in the most complimentary way ever that you could be in the CIA. It's also based on nothing. I have no experience, so don't take the compliment for that. But yeah, it's. That's. I mean, 
tie that back into the book, right? It's what we said at the beginning. You can't go in with just a list of questions and we're going to knock down this mafia guy now, but you can go in like the MCAT, you can go in loaded up with a thousand equations memorized. And if you did want to know everything going into investigation, well, what if you didn't have the actual, like, I guess, portfolio or file on the person, right? And you couldn't know where they're from, what they did and what exactly you're looking for. Even if you don't have specific questions, you'd still want that background. And what you were just saying about the hotline is there's like a more abstract step behind that. What if you know literally nothing about them? And I know that term's always kind of thrown around by my, my, my generation, literally, literally. But if you literally don't know anything about that person, you would want at the very least an abstract sort of framework of how to how to go about investigation and you could learn that through purchasing art of the investigation available on amazon right <laughs> sorry i had to plug it I was... <laughs> <laughs> but really right that's what you would do is all, all kidding aside is you would you would learn at the very least the ground framework of how to go about it and that's what this book is correct that's absolutely right. And that's why we wanted to put it out there. Yeah. Um, do we have time to talk about a few more? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, this is, right. this, this is an incredible, incredible story. I know we don't have that much time left, but this is, I mean, if we're going to end on a story, this is really a great story to end what, on. What, and that's, I was going to say, and then after this, I'll Bruce, I'll email you or you, Dr. Benz, let's absolutely do an art of an art of the investigation part two, and we'll know how to go about it next time. You'll host it. We'll do the, all we'll right, do the PowerPoint. Terrific. So yeah, terrific. just don't, don't feel that we got to jam it all in in five minutes. Like, yeah, let's do oh, it. No, no. That'd be great. We'd like that. Absolutely. We can do a part yeah, two, a part 50. Come I, don't back. Plan, I don't plan and, on stopping this. Um, this story, I don't know if you want to do this story right now if you want to start with this story because it's an incredible story of a serial killer who killed young women and stored the body in his home in, in his home where he lived with his brother and mother and father and they had no idea that there were dead bodies in the house let's Let's save that for a strong <laughs> opener because I don't want to. I don't want to not do this one justice. Why don't we open with that on a, the next one? A strong opener. I will. Yeah, you because that'll get people to come back. Absolutely. Just to hear the details that's, of the totally true story. That's the, I mean, totally. That's the, tease. that's the cliffhanger, right? As I, even though yes. as early on I was crapping on nighttime TV, I am now full hypocrite. That's exactly what I'm doing. Tune in next week, and you can get this story. <laughs> but hey, that's exactly what I'm doing, and. Whatever, it's my podcast. I can be a hypocrite. I don't care what anyone thinks. But, um, yeah, we can abs – I mean – It's a great story to start off with next time. Absolutely. I know, it I, is. Yeah, I know next week is is, is Thanksgiving and stuff. But um, I we don't have to choose a date right now. But, I mean, we can definitely do one in, in the December, like before – after Thanksgiving, before Christmas. Does that sound good? Yeah, sounds good to me. Okay. About, let's do it. Let's do it. You guys, you guys tell me the date, and I'll be there. All right? Okay. All right. Perfect. All right. Sounds great. Dr. Chelsea Benz, Special Agent Bruce Sackman, a super awesome podcaster, Tommy Kerrigan. Thank you guys for coming on here. Art of the Investigation it will be in the thumbnail, the link, the link, the sticky link in the, the st my God, the top comment and the link will be in the description and in the thumbnail and learn about killing people and stuffing their bodies in your house and then going to have dinner with your family and no one being the wiser. That will be part two. So show up next time, everybody. <laughs> Thank you so much, my friends. Until next Thank time, you, Tommy. happy Thank Thanksgiving. You. God bless America. Stay safe, everybody. You. Enjoy yourself. Thank and, you. Uh, yeah, I can't wait for the next one. All right, my guys. Take it easy. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. <laughs> Bye-bye. <laughs>